Hi, I'm Jeff Crane, President of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Thanks for joining us today at the 2020 ICAST Online Conservation Seminar. The Congressional Sportsman's Foundation has a singular focus. We work to promote hunting, angling, and fishing in the halls of government. We are laser focused and at work every day on behalf of all of us as fellow anglers and outdoors men and women. Started over 30 years ago to support the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, both CSF and the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus have grown substantially. The Congressional Sportsman's Caucus is now the largest, most active bipartisan caucus in the United States Congress with nearly 300 members. With leadership in both the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat, this is a direct line of access for us as sportsmen and women to talk to politicians. Realizing that most of the wildlife management decisions that affect us as sportsmen and women happen at the state level, in 2004, CSF launched a network of state legislative sportsmen's caucuses that has now grown to 50 states and over 2,000 state legislators, giving us direct access again to these elected officials to promote and protect our sporting heritage. And last but not least, in 2009, we started a bipartisan governor's sportsman's caucus with now 27 sitting governors as the third leg to this important stool. So advocacy and policy is exactly what we do day in and day out. I'm gonna turn the program over to your moderator, a good friend of ours, Chris Horton, CSF's Director of Fisheries Policy who's gonna introduce you to some key legislators that will talk about some recent successes that will affect all of us as anglers and hunters. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce Harlan Kent, CSF board member and CEO of Pure Fishing. Hi, I'm Harlan Kent. I'm standing at a set where we've been talking about new products of Pure Fishing. I think it's uh, one that I'm most proud of is, is our new Liberty Reel here, which talks about United We Stand and has the American flag on the inside of the cylinder. I had the good fortune over the past year to join the board of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Pure Fishing has been a big supporter at both the board level as well as at the state and local level of CSF. And we believe that CSF is the leader in protecting and advancing the interests of American anglers and hunters. Led by Jeff Crane, this is a team of knowledgeable and effective folks who make sure that the voices of those passionate about the sporting lifestyle are heard. Their work at the federal policy level with Congress as well as at the state and local levels with governors and with legislators makes things happen. Their list of initiatives is lengthy, but we applaud big wins, recent big wins, and their leadership on the Great American Outdoors Act, which increases public access to land and water, as well as conservation. Their support of the reauthorization of the Sports Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund, which manages $650 million of on-the-ground state-driven fisheries conservation programs, as well as hashtag Responsible Recreation Initiative, which we're a big fan of. These are just to name a few. Pure Fishing and at Pure Fishing, we believe that the fishing industry is a hyper-regional business and that CSF supports not only the national issue works and address that, but they also address the matters that matter most to local sportsmen and anglers as well. This is a great group, and we look forward to continuing to support the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation and their very important work that they do. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Harlan. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Chris Horton. I'm the Senior Director of Fisheries Policy for the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. 
We appreciate you joining us today. We're going to talk a little bit about the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, as well as the State Legislative Code and Sportsman's Caucuses. We're also going to talk about some of the policy examples related to, to recreational angling and the fishing industry that they've been working on, as well as talk a little bit about how you can get involved. But rather than just me talk about it, we're fortunate to be joined by two of the respective leaders of their, their uh, Sportsman's Caucuses today. First up is Congressman Mark Vesey from Texas. Congressman V.C. is one of the co-chairs in the House for the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, which, as Jeff mentioned, is the largest bipartisan caucus in Washington, D.C. Congressman V.C., thanks for joining us today and welcome. Hey, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Everything's going great here uh, in Fort Worth. So um, I, would, I, I guess I, I, was, I want to welcome you to my hometown, but I guess that I'm not where you are and you're not where I'm at. So, but. Um, I hope that there that there will be I know there'll be people here um, uh, from Fort Worth that are going to be watching. And so I want to know that you're always welcome to, to come here uh, because this is a town where people really appreciate the great outdoors uh, and appreciate the experience of, uh, you know, clean air, clean water uh, and everything that it affords us uh, in the hunting and fishing space. Well, well, I appreciate it. I, I love Fort Worth, Dallas area. I've been there many times. Uh, I guess some pretty good fishing around, around town there as well. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, t- tell, us, tell us a little bit about yourself, some background on you. Well, I'm, I was born here in Fort Worth. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, we have so many new people that live here now. Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Metro has been one of the fastest growing regions in the entire country. But uh, I'm from here. I'm second generation. My mom was the first uh, of her nine siblings that were actually born in Fort Worth. My grandparents moved here about 1949, 1950, and my mother was born here. And so, uh, you know, uh, I love uh, this community and this town uh, and enjoy representing uh, it in, um, uh, in, in, on, in the U.S. Capitol. Uh, before I was in the United States House of Representatives, I was in the state legislature, and before that worked for a U.S. congressman and graduated from Texas Wesleyan uh, University. Okay. Uh, my wife and I, uh, um, she was also from Fort Worth. We have a, a child here. He's in Fort Worth Independent School District. Uh, and uh, like all other 14-year-olds, he's ready to get back to school so he can be with his friends. At first, in March, he couldn't. He was happy that school was going to be uh, delayed or canceled for the rest of the year. Now he's like, when do I? When can I escape from my parents? So <laughs> it's it's uh, you know it, things have like changed a little bit since March. <laughs> Yes, they have for all of us, for sure, for sure. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, but so my roots are, are are pretty strong here. I and you know I grew I grew up um, uh, doing a lot of uh, bank fishing. We we couldn't afford a boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lake in between the city of Fort Worth and city of Arlington. It's Lake Arlington, and that's really where I learned to uh, appreciate the outdoors. Okay, so you, you grew up fishing from an early age then. Yeah, we were fishing from a very early age. My my grandmother uh, on my dad's side of the family was from Marshall, Texas. They were from East East Texas, mm-hmm. and um, and so you know they they did it the old fashioned way. They ate fish the way that people don't even know how to eat fish anymore. I, I can mm-hmm. remember my grandmother, you know, sitting there. We would go to Lake Arlington, or someone would catch a bunch of fish down in East Texas, and they would drive them back up. To Fort Worth, and my grandmother would, you know, get ready to have a big fish fry. And I can vividly remember her, you know, scaling the fish. Scaling the fish, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sitting there and yep. then scaling them and be, being very diligent about it. And she was uh-huh. an outstanding cook. Uh, and just having just a ball, having a great time. Yeah. And the fish always taste good. You know, those crappie and uh, those perch and, mm-hmm. you know, and catfish, you know, that they would like catch. It was, it was always a lot of fun. And, she used to, my grandmother had, uh, believe it or not, she had a bunch of cane poles that she brought that's up right. from East Texas with her. And that's where we first learned how to fish was using those old cane poles, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and that was and, and that was really my first experience with fishing. Well, we're very much alike because my very first memory, one of my earliest memories was with fishing with my grandmother. I can remember her vividly, her straw hat. We had a cane pole a can of Folgers can of, of uh, red worms. And we went to a local Creek and watching that red and white plastic bobber go under. That's uh, right. Excited. <laughs> I mean, that just hooked me for life right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, 
And I can remember my, my dad, he was always emphasizing cleaning up at the lake, mm -hmm. you know, so we would never leave our worm, you know, cartons, uh, you know, out there or, you know, or, or trash from, you know, opening up a package of weights or, or, or what have you. We would like never leave mm -hmm. that stuff laying around. He always emphasized like cleaning up behind ourselves. Uh, and I think that a combination of cleaning up behind ourselves and just watching the world wake up in the morning, you mm -hmm. know, when you get up, you, you, when you get to that lake early in the morning and you're sleepy, especially being a little kid and you wish that you could have just slept the end. But when you get out there, you really appreciate it. Right. And, right. Um, and, and it, it is, it, it's truly an incredible experience, almost more of an, of an amazing experience than the hunting or fishing itself mm -hmm. than to get up and just watch God's world wake up. It, it's something that I never get tired of. Uh, the last duck hunt that I did before the, the end of the season here in Fort Worth, uh, it was incredible. It was, mm -hmm. just, it was incredible watching the sunrise. And it's something, even though it's the same experience, each time I feel like it's a different experience because uh, it is so amazing uh, just to watch uh, what God created uh, begin uh, to take shape and form in the morning uh, as we progress throughout the rest of our day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Uh, so when were you first elected to Congress? I was elected to Congress uh, in 2012. And so okay. I was sworn in January the 3rd, 2013 on my birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, that's, so it's interesting having your, being sworn in on your birthday because there's so much going on. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, yeah. And so it, it was really, it was absolutely incredible. So we actually did a, a birthday dinner for me the day before because we knew the day of that it was going to be tough to actually be able to celebrate my birthday. Yeah. Uh, but, but that was, so I'm now my fourth term and so my first three terms on armed services and science, space and technology. And now I'm on the energy and commerce committee. Okay. Well, you joined the Sportsman's Caucus in 2015. So tell us a little bit uh, from your perspective why you thought it was important to join the Sportsman's Caucus. Not only that, but you've dedicated time to serving the leadership capacity. Some of your yeah. time to do that. So tell us a little bit about that, why you felt it was important. I thought that it was important to join, you know, A, because I love the great outdoors. And when I heard about the caucus and their mission uh, to not only promote you know, uh, outdoor sports and outdoor activities, uh, but also their, their role in conservation uh, mm -hmm. and trying to create bipartisan pieces of legislation that encourage us to take care of our earth and to uh, and, and be wise in our conservation of it uh, and to come up with different strategies and different uh, means of legislation uh, to be able to make sure that we protect uh, you know, the, what God has given us and that we keep it around for generations to, to come uh, and that we also encourage future generations to participate in outdoor sporting and outdoor activities to, to make sure that we keep that going because it's such a, it, it's, it's such an incredible part of the American, um, of American history and something that really uh, binds all of us together really since the beginning of our republic is, uh, is people surviving uh, on the out, out in out in the outdoors and through nature, uh, and of course that's evolved over the years and 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 what that means. Uh, but uh, I really believe that um, uh, that I I hope that I'm helping uh, not only make Congress a better place, but you know through the legislation that we work on and through the principles that we believe in. I hope that I'm really um, uh, setting up a situation where I'm leaving behind a better you know, a uh, world as it relates to, to the outdoors for my son and hopefully for his kids when, you know, when he gets ready to have them. Well, we certainly appreciate your leadership. Uh, you've been, you've been great, uh, a leader for the caucus. You've been very engaged and active and, and have always been there whenever we needed you. So. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, switching gears a little bit to, to policy. Uh, you are actually, a co, uh, one of the original co-sponsors uh, with Congressman Rob Whitman uh, for a bill that's near and dear to my heart as a former state fisheries biologist and somebody that's dedicated my career to fisheries conservation, and that is the National Fish Habitat Conservation Through Partnerships Act, or HR 1747. Uh, can yeah. you a little bit about that bill? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a good bill. I mean, it really works, I think, uh, over time to help protect, restore, and enhance 
you know, our nation's uh, fishing and aquatic communities through, you know, very strategic partnerships, mm-hmm. uh, you know, which again is, is, is key to the whole outdoor thing uh, working. Um, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, there are currently about 20 recognized partnerships that take this bottom up approach to ensure uh, that these projects will continue to focus uh, on local and state uh, uh, level uh, strategies that really address uh, the needs that we have uh, in fishing in fishing resources. And so, mm-hmm. uh, I'm excited uh, that we're working on this and that uh, and that we uh, that we that we have movement on this. Of course, everything is a challenge now under COVID-19 uh, mm-hmm. and the amount of time that we're uh, in Washington D.C. But this is something that you know that I'm very committed to. Uh, because I think that it's it's truly important, uh, and it's and and it's something, and I think it's important. I'm glad that you pointed out how this is the largest caucus in the U.S. Congress, uh, because I really think that it is it is important that when we can work on issues like this that can bind us together as Democrats mm-hmm. and Republicans, uh, that we really work on them and highlight them as much as possible, so the American public that can see that we are doing things uh, for the country uh, that are truly good for everybody in a bipartisan manner. Right, right. Well, we thank you for your, your efforts on that. Uh, the National Fish Habitat Through Conservation Partnerships Act was uh, included in the ACE Act, which uh, was, uh, came out of the, the, the House and went to the Senate, and the Senate has mended that and uh, sent it back to the House. So literally, we're like one vote away from getting this thing over the finish line. Uh, and it's something that we've been working on for 14 years and it's it just basically authorizes uh, authorizes a program that's already been in existence that uh, currently only gets about seven million dollars a year uh, through the U.S. Wildlife Service budget but those 20 partnerships have been incredible in leveraging that little bit of federal dollars uh, with state partners dollars so uh, it's a great great program really appreciate your leadership and hopefully we can punch this one in across the go line here. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that we're we're able uh, to do that. I know that I've talked with Mike Thompson, you know, and I've talked with Martin Heinrich over on the Senate side, and you know, let our leadership know just how important this legislation is. All right. Next up, I want to talk about an important piece of legislation that is already passed, and actually, the Center for Sport Fishing Policy held another one of these conservation seminars earlier in the week at ICAST Online, and that was the Modern Fish Act. Now, you, you were one of the first Democrats, along with your fellow former uh, Congressman Gene Green in Texas, who actually signed mm-hmm. off this bill uh, early on after it was introduced. And I think that was, play, that was critical to demonstrate that this is, this is truly a bipartisan effort here to do something different for, for recreation fisheries management. So can you tell me a little bit about why you felt it was important to sign on to that bill? Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I was in the state legislature mm-hmm. uh, before I was in the U.S. Uh, House and in the state legislature. Uh, you learn a lot about the importance of uh, saltwater fishing, uh, and it is hugely important to the Texas economy. Uh, it is um, uh, something that um, you know was talked about a lot. You go into members' offices and you see, you know, some of uh, some of the their catches and and pictures and and things like that that they have uh, experienced, you know, with their friends and families over the years, and and it's a huge part of our economy. Uh, and our wildlife department does such a, a good job uh, in managing our coastal uh, waterways. And I thought that uh, being able uh, to have uh, this particular bill passed would be a good way to sort of complement the good work that we already uh, do here. Uh, just because recreational uh, angling and uh, commercial uh, fishing, uh, those are, 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 are two things that are, again, just it, very vital to the Texas economy and the federal law that governs marine fisheries uh, has largely focused on managing fisheries for the commercial side of the coin uh, and not so much the recreational. And so I just thought it was really important that we look for ways that we could better manage uh, the recreational fisheries while ensuring that we have a healthy uh, abundant of fish uh, out in the population for everybody to enjoy. So we can keep that story going in Texas because it it is, uh, it's it, it's 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 big here, and and of mm-hmm. course where I live in Texas, you have to drive a long way to be able to take advantage of this. Uh, but it's something that people here in the North Texas area do on a on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is it, it it's it's that big, and you know I don't have to explain it to people that live in other states where this is also a big part of their economy 
and a part of their way of life. Uh, but, uh, you know, being able to enhance that and being able to have that better managed, I think, is just is really essential. Uh, and again, it complements the good work that's already happening here, you know, with uh, our agencies that manage fish and wildlife uh, in Texas. Well, again, thank you for very much for your leadership on that. Absolutely. It was critical early on to demonstrate that, hey, this is something that's, again, like, like most hunting, fishing, natural resource conservation, it should transcend party lines and let's work. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No question. So, all right. One final topic that I want to talk to you about, and that's the Great American Outdoors Act. Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been heralded as the single uh, greatest co uh, commitment to increasing uh, public access and advancing conservation in, in our lifetime. And you're a co-sponsor of that bill in the House. And uh, yeah. it just moved out of the Senate and just passed the Senate recently. And uh, so tell us a little bit about that bill and what it does. No, this is a great bill. I mean, $9.5 billion uh, to address uh, maintenance backlogs and uh, a lot of the crumbling infrastructure uh, that we have at our national uh, parks. And, you know, I had a chance to visit one of the national parks when I was in Colorado recently. Uh, when we were staying in Durango, uh, and it's incredible, uh, you know, the, the work uh, that uh, the, the the federal officials do to maintain these parks. Uh, but again, you know, if we can do something to to help them uh, with this crumbling infrastructure, I think that it's important. I mean, if you you know the inclusion of uh, BLM uh, uh, and uh, the maintenance backlog in the bill is critically important to. Uh, the sportsmen and, and sportswomen of this country. Uh, you're looking at collectively uh, through these agencies, uh, uh, you, you know, that they're providing roughly 25 million hunting days uh, and 45 million uh, fishing days. Uh, and, and, and it fully uh, and permanently uh, funds the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, at, about, at around $900 million annually, uh, which is the most successful and influential conservation programs that we've had in our nation's history. Uh, and already the program has completed a conservation recreation or access project in every single county in the country. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, that's hugely significant. And so, you know, I think that, that this is going to be a very uh, historic and significant way uh, to conserve our federal uh, lands and waters uh, and also uh, increase recreational opportunities uh, and even some jobs along the way. Uh, and there are more and more young people that you meet from our colleges uh, and from uh, campuses around the country that say they would like to be able to uh, have a job where they work outdoors uh, and where mm -hmm. they help maintain a lot of our great parks. And so uh, I think that, that this is really going to be a wonderful bill. So I know it's hard to predict what's going to happen in Congress. It time, is. Especially yeah. now. But what, yeah. what do you think the chances of it passing on, on the House side? Since it's, it's already passed the Senate. Yeah, I think that it's good. Uh, it's, it's, it, look, and it is. We're in a challenging environment right mm -hmm. now uh, and trying to get as much done as we possibly can with the, with the abbreviated schedule that we've been on since COVID-19 is very difficult. Uh, but I do know that there is a, you know, that there is a desire uh, for these bills to get passed, uh, and uh, and you know, and they, again, they you know, we've talked about them. You know, I've encouraged they uh, that they uh, become passed. I know the people that have worked so hard on them. Uh, you know, really want to take advantage of this opportunity that we have, this this moment of bipartisanship to work on these bills, uh, because we know that they're hugely important for the country. And uh, and so with that, you know, I actually feel fairly good about it. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're using all of our time wisely between now uh, and the end of the year to make sure that we get it done. Well, Congressman, it's been great. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your leadership on behalf of anglers and in the, in the angling industry, not only in Texas, but across the country. And, you know, hopefully we can uh, get back to normal before too long. And, and I look I forward to seeing you again. And, uh, Hopefully on the water the next time we have a congressional fishing competition, which hopefully maybe th things go well, maybe next spring or, or summer, we can get back out on the bay and chase some strippers. That would be nice. That would, that, would, that would be, after everything we're going through now, much yeah. needed. Yeah. Our next guest is Representative Pat Brennan. Representative Brennan 
is a current co-chair of the Vermont Legislative Sportsman's Caucus, one of 49 state legislative sportsman's caucuses around the country. Representative Brennan, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, it's my pleasure. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where were you well, raised? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a native Vermonter. Uh, lived here for 67 years, uh, hunt and fish. Uh, you know, when I grew up, I had uh, the luxury of being able to walk out the, my back door and, uh, and fish in a river, the Winooski River, uh, about a tenth of a mile away and uh, hunt in the backyard. And it was great. So I can't do can't say that anymore. It's a little uh, developed at this point. But uh, yeah, it was it was a great, uh, great life growing up in uh, Vermont. That's great. So you grew up you grew up hunting and fishing. I did. In early age. Okay. I did. Uh, I I was self-taught uh, when I was younger, and uh, mm -hmm. then I got in with some of the boys who really knew what they were doing, and uh, they showed me the ropes. And I've been hunting and fishing ever since. Okay. Well, is is there a particular fishing trip, or a particular fish, or a particular uh, uh, location that you fish that really stands out in, in, in your favorite experiences fishing? Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. Uh, the, we, uh, the uh, executive council took a trip for our mid-year meeting to New Mexico a few years back, and we fished the uh, San Juan. I believe, was it the San Juan? Yep, in San Juan. And uh, that was my initiation into fly fishing for, uh, for trout. And I'll tell you what, it was, uh, it was an experience for me. I, I was learning on the go. Uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, I don't think the uh, member from New Hampshire, Jeff Goley, will ever forget it either. I think I might have hooked him a couple times, but uh, we had a blast and we caught some some great fish. And uh, it'll go down to history as one of my best uh, best trips. That is for sure a phenomenal river, and probably on every fly fisherman's bucket list, I'm sure. Yeah, I bet. So, what compelled you to run for office and to serve the people of Vermont? Well, actually, I was I was initially prodded by a, a few neighbors. I, I had a neighbor who was a legislator lived right across the street, so we ran together. Uh, but I and I had turned it down a couple times before that. Uh, you know, I saw the need for uh, a little bit of common sense interjected into all this pol political uh, stuff. You know, and there there's a our, I guess legislatures in in the greater picture are sadly lacking in common sense. So I, uh, I had a lot on my mind. Uh, we, you know, Vermont suffers from uh, transportation woes. Uh, Fish and wildlife was always underfunded and that was, that was continually on my mind. Um, so I wanted to see what I could do. And uh, that's the best way to do it is get involved. So how important are hunting and fishing to the people of Vermont, the state of Vermont? And can you give us a sense of, you know, which of each of those is kind of the most popular? What species? Well, uh, as far as fishing goes, um, I would say we're, we're one of the premier bass fisheries, Lake Champlain, we've got right outside the uh, front door here. And it's one of the greatest uh, bass fisheries in the country. Uh, I might be tooting my own horn there, but, uh, <laughs> And you know, a lot of people ice fish. Ice fishing up here is really popular for uh, you know um, northerns, walleye, and and perch. So uh, those two things on, on the fishing side are are really a big draw. Um, hunting, uh, I'm going to go with my two favorites, and I think it's probably uh, would hold true for most hunters. And that's white-tailed deer and uh, turkey. So when did you first join the Vermont Legislative Sportsman's Caucus? I joined uh, the Sportsman's Caucus, I believe, in 2006. Um, it might have been 2005, I'm a little fuzzy on that. Um, but yeah, uh, a guy named Steve Adams started the caucus here in Vermont. And um, I joined uh, just about as soon as he got it going and uh, took over from him as caucus co-chair when he left the legislature and uh, been involved ever since. Can you give folks a sense of, of what the caucus does or just a quick overview of the caucus in general? 
Yeah, it, the Vermont caucus, and I think it's similar to most caucuses around the country, um, we we get involved with the local boots on the ground folks, you know, the uh, hunting clubs. Um, we listen to their concerns. Uh, we're a sounding board for them. Uh, they come to us with, with uh, ideas. We pass those ideas on in the form of legislation. And uh, we share basically share our experiences and and uh, we're continually working to see how we can make things better. So why do you think it's important to have a state legislative sportsman's caucus? Well, it's it's extremely important because we are the uh, we are the last let's say the last line of defense for the hunting and fishing community. Um, if they see a have an issue and need something taken care of we're the people they come to see and, and talk to we're the ones who can um initiate legislation and through uh through a bipartisan effort um tripartisan effort in our case up here um get things done and work together to get things done very important you know i think what you just mentioned is a key component of that and something that uh Congressman Vesey just spoke to as well is, is that it's bipartisan. I mean, hunting, fishing, natural resource conservation should be bipartisan issues, and uh, we can all find common ground on those things, ideally, in an you know, ideal world. You know, another aspect of the caucuses that we found, state legislative caucuses, is um, it's been important and to help foster good policy is for that caucus to have a our state natural resource agency and working on their behalf and and you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons you got involved with politics was because you had concerns funding concerns for the for the state vermont agency there for to be able to continue to conserve fish and wildlife but i know that you guys do have a good relationship there and, and work with them yeah we do we have an excellent relationship with uh, the fish and wildlife folks and the a and r folks and uh, i hope that continues um uh, the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife and I are, are good friends and uh, work together well. Um, if I have a, an issue or we have a legislative issue, we can go to him he, and he can vice versa uh, come to us and we work together to get things done. You're also a member, not only are you a, a caucus co-chair of the Vermont Legislative Sportsman's Caucus, but you're also a member of the National Assembly of Sportsman's Caucus's Executive Council. What's the significance of that council? Well, it's very important. First of all, it serves as a, an advisory entity for, for CFS management of the NAS program. Um, it's also a bipartisan group of legislators. It's 14 uh, legislators from all over the country sharing ideas. Um, the best part of that is getting together and see how other states do things. And this gives us, this is a great opportunity to uh, uh, share ideas and providing pro sportsmen uh, agendas that we we in Vermont do and and share that with other states and have them share theirs with us. All right, shifting gears a little bit to talk about some specific fishing related policy uh, examples there in Vermont. You and your colleagues in the caucus played uh, really a critical role on behalf of anglers when the Salisbury hatchery was recently threatened with closure. And I know there are a lot of moving parts here. But in a nutshell, can you give us some background on the Salisbury hatchery, its importance to the state, and why it was threatened with closure? Yeah, uh, just a quick background. It, first of all, it was built in 1931, so it's been around a long time. It's, uh, it raises brood stock. It's, uh, I should say that it's also on the National uh, Historic Registry, too. And it, it's, it was built and designed by an architect, so it's not your average run-of-the-mill um, building it's 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 pretty neat actually yeah. it's a, it's a nice nice setup and uh last year um due to budget constraints the, the long and short of it is the the governor thought some of the other state-of-the-art um, hatcheries we have here in vermont could handle the uh the loss of say salisbury and um there were a couple issues with age there were a couple issues with um discharge permits and you know when you get into that stuff you dig in a little deeper and you find out that the discharge point where they were testing had been moved up several hundred yards closer to the building and uh, 
whether it was a mistake or whether it was designed that way. But uh, so that put the um, the discharge permit in jeopardy. So we we got the A and R involved. We got all the sportsmen involved, and basically it was a five hundred thousand dollar fix we had to come up with, and uh, that's what the governor cut out of the budget. It was the five hundred thousand dollars to fix Salisbury, and um, we we saw the significance of keeping that in play. So we gathered up the sportsmen, uh, hunters, hunters, and fishermen. And we met in the governor's office one day, about 30 or 40 strong, and proposed a $1 increase on our hunting and fishing licenses. And he thought, he looked at us and thought we were nuts. We wanted to increase our licenses. It was all about keeping Salisbury open. And I think that was an eye opener for the governor. And I think it was an eye opener to uh, people who underestimate the power of the sporting community. And so it was a great example of people coming together and in getting things done and raising enough money to keep that hatchery open. Well, that's awesome. And that's uh, that, that's a testament to anglers were the original conservationists and continue to be so when there's a need you step up to the plate and get it done. But license fees alone weren't the only issue. You had to find some additional grant money. We did have to, we raised about 250 through uh, license increases and the other 250 we got from the capital. Uh, we had some friends on our committee up there that um, were sympathetic to the cause and hopefully they were hunters and fishermen too. And uh, so we, through capital bonding, we, we got the other 250 with a little bit of help from appropriations. My good friend Bob Helm here is a member of our caucus, um, sits on appropriations, and uh, he was, a, he was a, a crusader for that cause. So we, together with those two, uh, two uh, money venues, came up with $500,000. And Salisbury is still open. Salisbury is still open, and it will be for a while. Well, thank you so much for your leadership there. And I know uh, the anglers of Vermont really appreciate it as well. Thank you. You're quite welcome. So from a national perspective, what do you see as some of the potential challenges for recreational angling in the future? Well, I, I think recruitment, getting people involved. Um, I'd like to see, uh, well, we have programs. I'd like to see more, more done at the, uh, <clears throat> the early ages when children are developing, get them outdoors, get them thinking about uh, the outdoors. Um, Put a fishing pole on their hand at a young age and get them involved. It's it's all about that. We need to uh, we need to promote ourselves. We need to do a better job at promoting ourselves. And and uh, I think as soon as people experience it and and get a chance to get out and do these things, um, I think the sport will grow. Yep, I, I think you're right. And Absolutely agree, and I think you would find other legislators and other state uh, sportsmen's caucuses across the country, as well as state agencies, saying that that is one of our biggest challenges: is recruitment, retention, reactivation, and and making sure that we have this that the new anglers coming in, so that we can continue this funding model of, of supporting fisheries and conservation well into the future, and having healthy, abundant fisheries. Uh, maybe the silver lining to the pandemic is is. Uh, folks slowing down, getting outdoors, and enjoying things like fishing and hunting a little bit more. I know that a lot of states are seeing an uptick. And I, is that the same for Vermont? That is. You know, I, I was just thinking about that. In Vermont, so far this year, we sold twice as many licenses as we did all last year this, on the fishing side. And, um, you know, that's a testament to people having a lot of time on their hands and are saying, hey, let's, let's go fishing. And hopefully that catches on. And that sustains itself. So uh, right now, it's we're, we're, licenses are through the roof. So from your perspective, what can anglers or members from the industry, what can they do to get more involved with the State Legislative Sportsman's Caucus or, or with policy at the state level? Well, I, I think it's important to, um, to talk first talk to their local uh, hunting and fishing clubs and then in turn look to us as legislators and members of the uh, legislative local sportsmen's caucuses to uh, 
to get together and sit down and chat. I, I know in Vermont here, we host a, a couple get togethers with the sporting uh, community every year. And what it is, is it's a uh, information sharing um, event. You know, uh, we're all like-minded folks and we, we sit down and, and talk about things. And I think to keep that going, legislators have to be involved with their community. Absolutely. It's, it's really, it's no different than business. I mean, policy and legislation, it's all about relationships and, and those events, whether they be a briefing at the Capitol or maybe a, uh, even a sporting clays friendly competition at a range, it's an opportunity to spend some time with legislators and legislators spend time with sports and um, community members and develop that, that uh, relationship. I mean, even if there's not something policy oriented that they want to address right now, uh, developing those relationships so that when something does come up, uh, that mm -hmm. communication is already there. So, Correct. Representative Brennan, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate everything that, uh, everything that you do there in the state of Vermont, everything that you do nationally from the uh, National Assembly Sportsman's Caucus's perspective. Um, I do have one more question, a, kind of a fun question, but so if you won a lottery, but the lottery isn't actually a pot of money, it is five days to go fishing anywhere you want, completely outfitted with all the gear you need, with all the charter license or the guides or whatever you might need, five days anywhere in the world, where would it, where would it be? Where would it be? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not privy to uh, some of the premier fishing holes around the world, but I have seen one in New Mexico there that I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed and I would have, and the whole experience was great. I'd have to say I'd go back there. I think that would be a great choice. I think that'd be a yep. great choice. Yep. Representative Brandon, thank you so much. Again, appreciate everything you do on behalf of sportsmen and women. I'm happy the anglers and angling community there in Vermont and again, nationally. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, Chris. Thank you. Well, thanks again for taking the time to join us today and to learn a little bit more about Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. While we work alongside our partners at the American Sport Fishing Association, CCA, NMMA, Center for Sport Fishing Policy, and BASS to conserve and enhance our fisheries resources as well as access to those resources, CSF we can play a unique role in the conservation that our members, our members of the legislatures and governor's offices, their elected officials who we get to work with on natural resource policy uh, on a daily basis. While our address may be Washington, D.C., we have 10 staff members that are scattered across the country who are experts and experienced in, in policy at the local and regional levels. So if you're interested in getting involved with CSF, maybe attending a state legislative caucus event, or attending a Congressional Sportsman's Caucus event, maybe like the Congressional Fishing Competition, uh, whenever we can host events again, I encourage you to go to our website, congressionalsportsmen.org. Click on your state profile and find the CSF staff member that represents your region, your state. Connect with them. I would also encourage you while you're there to sign up for our uh, newsletter, The Sportsman's Voice, which covers state and federal policy topics that the caucuses and CSF is working on. While you're there, you should also sign up for Tracking Capitals if you're interested, which is a free service that allows you to track legislation in your states or in multiple states across multiple topics. It's a free service and I encourage you to use it. So thanks again. I uh, look forward to hopefully seeing many of you in person in next year's iCast, not on the water somewhere before. 